And welcome everybody to Real Egg in Prime Time. It's another episode of The Agronomist. Hey, thanks a lot for being here tonight. We're going to have a lot of fun. We're going to do a bit of a deep dive, a 60 minute deep dive into agronomic topics. Tonight, we're going to focus on nitrogen. And uh, it's, it, that's a pretty broad topic, I know. But we have two great experts here tonight to discuss some of the big issues for Western Canada and Eastern Canada as well. I'm really looking forward to it. Now, the key is you participate in the program. We are live, so if you have a question or comment, feel free to join in and enter your comment in the comment box, whether you're watching on Twitter, YouTube, Facebook, or Twitch. We love your questions, and I know our, our guests are looking forward to them as well. Let's bring in our guests right now. Uh, here they are, and right at the top, I want to introduce Greg Stewart of Mazex Seeds. Hey, Greg, how are you? Hey, good to be here. Hey, great to see you again. You've been a, you've been a guest on Real Ag Live in the afternoon before, so uh, here this is something new. We're in prime time, man. It's eight o'clock Eastern, so uh, glad you could stay up for us. <laughs> I'll try to stay awake the whole time. <laughs> good stuff. Uh, also joining us here is Jeff Shane, Doctor Jeff Shaneau of the University of Saskatchewan. Jeff, how are you? Very well, thank you. And Jeff, hey, where are you located? Uh, right now I'm at uh, Central Butte, uh, which is about 160 kilometers south of Saskatoon, doing my remote teaching uh, for my soil fertility and fertilizers class. So the University of Saskatchewan right now is closed, but uh, we continue to, uh, to uh, uh, do our teaching remotely and uh, try as best we can to keep our research program going as well. Yeah, everybody trying to make the best of it for sure. Uh, Jeff, talk quickly, introduce yourself to the audience here. There's people maybe that aren't aware of some of the work you're doing. Where, where's your research mainly focused? Sure. So, yeah, my name's Jeff Shano, and uh, I'm a professor of soil fertility in the soil science department in the College of Agriculture and Bioresources at the University of Saskatchewan. So where I what I do my work in is soil fertility, nutrient management, nutrient cycling, uh, a lot of soil management uh, aspects uh, in as well. Uh, a little bit outside of the fertility area sometimes, but mainly working in that fertility and uh, fertilizers. So some of the things that I've been working with most recently have been uh, animal manures and availability of nutrients, effects on the soil, uh, fertilization of, of forages, uh, also pulse crops, legumes, nitrogen fixation, management of those crops, as well as the, as the more uh, traditional uh, cereals and oil seeds. Great. Uh, Greg, how about yourself? Give us some of your background. Yeah. Uh, well, I went to the University of Guelph. I did a bit of school there uh, and uh, worked with the Provincial Ministry of Agriculture as an extension specialist. I probably spent maybe about a third of my time working on nitrogen uh, over that period. And then uh, back, I guess, five years ago or so, I left the government and joined uh, Mazex Seeds. Uh, a little bit less emphasis on uh, nitrogen management, but I do keep my hand in it in terms of uh, some research and trying to uh, trying to come up with good packages of information for uh, for growers. Okay, Greg, let, let's start with you. When when we talk about the 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 topic of nitrogen and management. It is a really broad topic. And what we're going to find out here in the coming clips is there is, there's a lot of strategies to choose from, which I think makes it a ever more interesting. And we keep continue to get more and more research and information that just helps us try to improve our decision-making on this topic. Yeah. So uh, to do a good job of nitrogen management, you have to integrate a lot of components. You've got to integrate, integrate uh, the products you're working with, of course, placement, timing, rate, uh, and then all of that uh, impacted by weather. Uh, you know, nitrogen would be easy to manage if it wasn't impacted by weather. Uh, but uh, when you add all of those things together, you really can't talk about nitrogen unless you're prepared to integrate a bunch of stuff into the discussion at the same time. Jeff, do you find that sometimes pe growers try to, and, and maybe some agronomists as well, try to simplify it and sort of ignore some of the complexities or do you advise that they try to simplify it? Well, I guess the way that I deal with it and uh, I think it, it works quite well uh, when I'm talking to growers and also in my own soil fertility and fertilizers class is coming back to the good old four R's, mm. the right source, the right rate, the right time, the right place for nitrogen. 
And if you kind of keep things in that context and uh, uh, consider nitrogen that way uh, and think about the nitrogen cycle and the processes that go on and how that all relates, how we can best manage the nutrients that we're adding in, in commercial fertilizer and manure, I think we don't go too far off track, Sean. It's not a cheap input. So we, we want to do it. We don't want to do it as effectively as possible. Having wastage, Jeff, uh, is just... It, uh, it's not we we want to avoid adding costs. Margins are tight enough, so we want to do we want to apply it as effectively and efficiently as possible. Yep, yeah, no, that uh, that's the strategy. The old adage I use is nutrients. Use them, don't lose them. Get them into the plant. That's an agronomic, economic, and environmental benefit. That's where you want them. Not into the water or up in the air. That's an economic loss to the grower, and it's not good for the environment either. So that's what we strive to do. How can we manage that nitrogen best to get it into that plant? Okay, let's watch our first clip. We're going to hear from John Hurd. He's a soil fertility specialist with Manitoba Agriculture, sort of talking about how there, there's a lot of strategies available to growers. Let's, let's pull up that first clip. This is John Hurd from Manitoba Agriculture. Yes, indeed. Uh, the Manitoba corn and corn growers did, did a study this spring uh, or a survey of farmers basically to see how it is that uh, the typical Manitoba farm groups are fertilizing corn and really uh, show how farmers are exploiting how corn is different than other crops. There are only, I think, 13 ways of oh timing and placement to fertilize that we, we found in the study. And so I have my uh, our corn uptake pattern here. I see, I see that's on screen. So what we find that uh, uh, about 30% of farmers in the year this uh, survey was done uh, typically apply fertilizer in the fall. Uh, very common on the clay soils and that's fall banded ammonia. So they'd be applying nitrogen way out here on this, on, uh, if the chart extended. Uh, further 30% uh, typically apply nitrogen uh, at or before seeding, uh, broadcast urea predominantly. And then we, we had about 15 to 20% would apply uh, nitrogen at seeding, often urea in a sideband application. And then we have about 20% that apply nitrogen in season, either side dressed uh, anhydrous ammonia or 28%, or what many farmers are, are trying and using now we're tooling up is dribble banding. So there is no one size fits all. There's a, a number of options. And within that, there's also different forms. One way that we've spoken here about accomplishing that split application is through simply using some controlled release fertilizers. That also accomplishes essentially a, a, a split uh, a supply of nitrogen to the crop. You mentioned we're seeing more of that in-season application though, as, as has been done in the Midwest US for a while. A while. Are, are we going to continue to see that trend unfold here? Farmers have the equipment, and because they can, they will. Uh, but uh, we, our research in 10 sites have, have not shown an advantage nor a disadvantage to splitting nitrogen in season. We might expect advantages in those years when we experience early season losses, when the plant isn't using much nitrogen, but if we have all upfront nitrogen, that nitrogen is vulnerable to loss. If, farmer, if we have those conditions and farmers have the option, to supplement in season, that's where we would might expect those systems to shine or have some possibilities. But in a normal year, uh, we just expect that uh, uh, there's no yield differences. It does, however, give farmers a chance to, to delay making that decision on how much they're going to put on and they can maybe react to uh, weather conditions. Yeah. Fall, fall nitrogen is still a very efficient way for us to handle nitrogen okay. in uh, uh, in our systems. And uh, we've had a dry fall, a dry spring, and we would expect in this year any fall applied nitrogen is just as efficient as spring applied. The flip side is if we have a, a wet fall, a wet spring, then we can have substantial losses. Okay. Mm -hmm. You mentioned the, the in-crop application being done with Y drops or, or equivalent to, to that yep. type of technology. Uh, speed, of course, is something that we need to be uh, uh, thinking about, not going too fast in, in corn. That can that can be a problem. Well, well, well we know those that tend to, to go a little fast. If those hoses are not applying to the soil, we, we can paint the crop with 28%. And 
and and we can see some leaf burn. My, my suggestion would simply be to slow down and enjoy your time in the corn crop and uh, put the nitrogen as close to the soil as you can. Slow down and enjoy your time in the crop. Uh, Greg, is there ever a corn <laughs> crop you haven't enjoyed yourself? Like, come on, like he, he says oh, it like it doesn't happen. It's, <laughs> it's, it's fairly rare that I don't enjoy being in the corn crop. But uh, he makes a really interesting point. When you talk about the dribble band technology or the, or the, 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 the dominant supplier is the Y-drop technology, you know, when you pull into a field and you're driving two miles an hour and those tubes are laying the 28 right to the bottom of the corn uh, row the way the pictures show it, uh, you get a feeling like that is a really good thing to do. When you get out into the middle of the field and the machine passes you at 12 miles an hour, or okay, let's be realistic, maybe maybe eight miles an hour, and the tubes are bouncing around a bit, that 28 is not laying on the soil surface the way you'd hoped it would. To use John's expression, you know, you can paint the corn crop a little bit. You know, 28 splashed up on the stem is uh, is is not going to be a good management approach. So it's it's sort of that that subtle difference between a technology that has the capability of maybe doing an exceptional job of laying 28 on the soil surface at the base of the corn plant, if done at a moderate speed, versus uh, you know too fast and the 28 now. Maybe you can't even find it on the soil surface, right? Mm. Jeff, growers in cereals are, are just starting. We're going to see some clips a little bit later where we talk about split split applications in cereals. But this is something that is just starting to be talked about a lot more, uh, whereas corn, you know, it's, it's definitely been a focus for a lot longer. Yes, I think, you know, for the split application of, of nitrogen for cereals as, as a risk management strategy, uh, works well. Uh, put some down at the time of seeding. If things look good, uh, looking at a high yield potential, get out there and put that nitrogen on. Uh, earlier you get it on, uh, generally that's uh, uh, the main benefit there goes towards yield. Delayed applications, uh, more of the benefit goes to protein rather than, than yield. Uh, I think a split nitrogen application for cereals, oil seeds in terms of efficiency uh, in Western Canada we tend to see the greatest benefit from that split application, Sean, uh, when uh, there's a high loss potential for the nitrogen, especially at seeding. Uh, I know in some trials there's been a benefit, depending on the year, a really wet year, that split application comes up on top as the application strategy. Uh, in a drier year, you really don't see much difference uh, often between that and putting it all on at the time of seeding. I know in some of the trials I was involved with, we also had comparison to uh, polymer-coated urea, and in those wet years, we saw polymer-coated urea and the split application generally tending to be at the top of the heap when it came to uh, an application strategy to uh, uh, minimize the losses and maximize the recovery, Sean. Uh, I guess the one thing I would, would comment a little bit on, yeah. uh, John talked about fall fertilization with anhydrous ammonia. And indeed, uh, anhydrous ammonia is an excellent nitrogen source. Uh, for fall application for small grains as well, uh, cereals and, and oil seeds uh, applied late enough in the, in the fall when the soil is cool. Uh, essentially, there's little or no nitrification. The nitrogen stays as ammonium. Uh, it's not lost and carries over into the, into the spring. If you want to put it on a little bit earlier, the other strategy you got is to use a nitrification inhibitor that will, even when the soil is warm then, uh, that nitrification inhibitor will halt that conversion of ammonium to that easily lost nitrate form. But now for on, on the anhydrous ammonia though, d doesn't your soil type have an impact on how effective that is going to be or am I wrong there? Oh yeah, sure thing. I okay. mean, when it comes to anhydrous ammonia, uh, one of the first things is to make sure that it stays in the soil when you're applying it. So you got to make sure that you've got soil conditions that are conducive to closure of that injection channel. Uh, also, the pH of the soil affects the retention of ammonia, uh, the conversion of ammonia into the ammonium ion where it's uh, uh, stuck in the soil. And if the pH is high, we tend to have um, uh, the equilibria shift towards the free ammonia form, and that means greater potential for volatilization losses. Also, soils that have a higher cation exchange capacity, high organic matter, high clay content, uh, will tend to uh, convert that to, uh, ammonia to the ammonium form better. And of course, water content is important. Uh, 
too much water, uh, we can end up with that injection channel being wide open and losing the ammonia through escape. If it's dry, well, the ammonia is mainly retained in the soil by reacting with water and converting to ammonia. So if it's dry, we need to go deeper in order to get that uh, ammonia a chance to retain to react with the water before it moves to the soil surface and escapes. Yeah. See, it's complicated. It's not, not easy stuff. So Greg, uh, John mentioned slow release. Uh, have growers seen success with some of like the ESN style products in, in Ontario with crops like corn and, and beans? Yeah, that's a, that's an excellent question. One that lots of people have looked at, uh, I guess if we use ESN as an example, ESN had some really nice uh, benefits uh, that, that weren't always uh, focused on its slow release. That is, if you wanted to build a starter fertilizer package with a high amount of nitrogen and you wanted to reduce the risk of burn on the corn seed or seedling and you wanted that dry blend to flow better, ESN was a beautiful fit much safer obviously than un unprotected urea and much more flowable so if you're say you're pulling a big cart uh, and you're uh, and you're running a, a 24 row corn planter and you're bringing a fair bit of dry fertilizer esn has been a nice fit there for safening up the band and making the uh the fertilizer blend flow be flow better than if you were using straight urea uh, so so there has been some real pluses there in terms of overall slow release, uh, in, in some of the work that I've done or read, boy, the advantage to slow release nitrogen has been tough to quantify if you're looking from a yield perspective. And I'll go back to my ESN story. You, you can put ESN down, compare, you look at the, the, uh, the nitrate concentration on the 10th of June, and let's say for fertilizer that was applied on the 1st of May, and if you look at the nitrate concentration, it's much lower for ESN than it is for urea. And you say, wow, that's exactly what I wanted to have happen. I wanted to make my nitrate pool, which is at risk to loss, uh, lower, right? Mm -hmm. and, and ESN accomplishes that. But if you don't have the June weather events that stimulate loss, either through leaching or denitrification, you don't necessarily see the benefit of having that small, smaller nitrate pool, even though it looks like it's a good thing to do. If you don't have the weather conditions or the soil types that interact to give you N losses, you may not see any advantage at the end of the day from a yield perspective. And, and, and I guess in our Eastern Ontario conditions, when we're on heavier soils that are more uh, susceptible to uh, uh, saturated conditions and denitrification, then you see some advantages from the ESN, keeping the nitrate pool smaller and therefore redu reducing some of the risk from denitrification. But that's often in an Ontario, Quebec scenario, that's often on your heavy soils and you might never see an advantage, or at least in my opinion, you might never see an advantage on a well-drained loam soil from using a slow release product. Jeff, uh, I see you nodding your head through some of that. What are your thoughts? Yeah, yeah, yeah. we've seen the same thing with uh, nitrification inhibitors. For example, on small grains, uh, again, those nitrification inhibitors uh, keep that nitrogen and ammonium form uh, for a period of time, uh, slowing the conversion to that easily lost nitrate. And that uh, same type of thing is that uh, uh, you can quantify, and we've done it out in the field. We've quantified it using uh, PRS resin membrane probes, uh, the ability of that nitrification inhibitor to keep that nitrogen in the ammonium form, but under uh, um, sometimes uh, you know low loss uh, scenario, uh, dry conditions, uh, we see we see little or no benefit from the nitrification inhibitor in terms of enhancing nitrogen uptake or yield when the conditions are such that there really isn't a lot of potential, as you say, Greg, for losses by leaching or denitrification. It's really in those wet years that we see the, those those benefits from from uh, uh, preventing that nitrate being formed uh, show up to the greatest extent. Weather, such a factor. That that's it is it's, such so, a factor. So so in uh, in the east, uh, Jeff, uh, we see much more risk from heavy soils and denitrification than we do from sandy ground and leaching. I was just wondering, 
what's your observation out west? Uh, do you lean more towards denitrification than leaching? Because in our Ontario Quebec conditions, it seems like denitrification is the is the animal you've got to deal with, and that leaching, yeah, once in a while, maybe on sandy ground if you really get a lot of rain, but not so not so much. Yeah, same thing out here. Denitrification is the main nitrogen loss mechanism. Uh, and a semi-arid subhuman environment, I mean, really uh, leaching, large losses of nitrate by leaching on an annual basis are pretty rare. Uh, maybe some right. sandy soils uh, on uh, soils that are, are in the kind of the northern agricultural fringe, uh, we may see. Uh, I remember uh, back in 2014, we had some really wet conditions. Some areas had 20 24 inches of precipitation during the growing season. Yeah, you could see after that, uh, uh, guys, that uh, uh, there was some nitrate movement out of the top 30 centimeters down into the 30 to 60, even a little bit below. Kind of interesting, though, is that uh, it turned dry a couple of years later, and actually that nitrate that was down deep there that had moved down actually played a significant role as a supply of, of, of nitrogen to crops that followed uh, in the drier years because those crops, they pull that water up from depth and with it comes the nitrate. Awesome. Hey, we're going to watch our next clip and it is with great, great discussion, guys. I really appreciate it. Our, our next clip is with uh, Peter Wheat Pete Johnson. He is Re Real Agriculture's agronomist. You frequently see him on uh, or hear him on Real Ag Radio as well as Real Ag Live and he was on here last week on The Agronomist. He talks about splitting in in Eastern and Western Canada and really looking at it as maybe a, a good insurance policy. Here's a clip with Peter Wee P. Johnson. And so we just came from an amazing wheat field, just an incredible wheat field. And now we're standing in, it, it's a solid wheat field, but it's not amazing. And you know, we get tons of questions, tons of questions about split nitrogen on wheat. So let's talk about split nitrogen on wheat. Which field do you think you should split the nitrogen on wheat? Well, that's a good question. So first back up. What does split nitrogen really do? Now this is true, whether we're talking about split nitrogen on corn, split nitrogen on wheat, any of the crops, really what split nitrogen does is simply buy you insurance. What does it buy you insurance from? Well, you know, the bugs in the soil surface, if they run out of oxygen, they still have to survive. And they're just like you and I, they're gonna to try to keep breathing. And the way they do that is they take the nitrate, it's NO3. So that means there's three oxygens there and no, uh, no real oxygen left. Well, they take that nitrate, those oxygens off that, and that's what they use as the electron receptor so they can survive and, and they don't really breathe, but so to speak, they can respire. And once they do that, NO3 becomes NO2 or NO or just N2, whatever, they're all gases and off they go into the atmosphere. So when I split my nitrogen, really what I'm doing, well, I'm protecting myself from if the soil gets saturated, that nitrogen loss. The other thing with split nitrogen that I'm doing is instead of making the decision for Western Canada, I put all my nitrogen on in the fall. Well, guess what? If I run out of moisture, that money's all spent. I have no management opportunity. In Ontario, if I put all my nitrogen on on the 15th of April, I have no management opportunity left. So if I split my nitrogen, I buy insurance from loss. That's a good thing from an environmental standpoint, absolutely. Plus, second application, I know what my moisture status is. I know what the temperature's been. With wheat, really critical what the temperature's been. I'm way smarter to make that nitrogen decision. So that's really how nitrogen plays and split nitrogen on wheat. The other thing that it does, the later I go with that second application, then the more protein I make. So if I'm going to split, when should I split? So the first application is sort of normal timing on wheat. The second application is always after second node. Why after second node? Because that's when I get away from standability issues. Second node, my, my stem elongation is set. 
so I can put more nitrogen on and I don't make it lodge. And of course, lodging is a big issue. And how big is that window? That's the other question I get asked. How big is that window? Well, I say growth stage 32, second node. I squeeze the stem, come up the stem, feel that first bump, that's first node. Go above that, if I can squeeze it again and it collapses, because we grow hollowed stem wheats for the most part, feel another bump, that's second node. I don't want to be able to squeeze above that and crush it or I'm too late. But the window there is actually quite big. So anytime from second node to flag leaf stage, that's good enough because the wheat crop really doesn't need that big shot of nitrogen until I get into pollination and grain fill. That's when I want the wheat crop to be going fast. So I get a big window there. It really works well. So that's sort of the timing. That's the reason we would do the whole split nitrogen thing. And then you come back and say, okay, which one of these two fields would I split nitrogen on? And a lot of growers are probably saying, well, this little wheat is where I'm going to split nitrogen. No, no, no. It's actually this big wheat. And so this big wheat, you know, we've got wheat here that has four tillers per plant. This is amazing early planted wheat. As soon as you get into amazing early planted wheat that's got all sorts of yield potential, this might be 130 bushel wheat. What happens? I want to crank the nitrogen rate. Got to support that, that yield potential. What happens when I crank the nitrogen rate and I plant early? I get taller wheat that flops. So this is the wheat that I would split the nitrogen on. This wheat where I have only one, maybe the odd plant with two tillers, but they're very weak tillers. Boy, this wheat, I want early nitrogen on and I can put it all on in one shot because I'm not very worried about this wheat lodging. Now, from a, a, a insurance policy, I can still split it here, but it doesn't have nearly the impact of on this bigger wheat. So a really interesting thought process around split nitrogen. I, I love split nitrogen because it makes you a better manager, but it won't always pay. And in our data set, added yield from split nitrogen, very rare, rare. Like that astounds me, but very rare to add yield. You can add protein, you can protect lodging, and you can make better decisions, buy your insurance from the loss, but not very often add yield. Totally different than what a lot of people think about split nitrogen on wheat. I hope that sorts it out, straightens that thought process. Peter Johnson, at WheatPete, realagriculture.com. Get that nitrogen on your wheat right. Like always, winning the contest for bringing the most energy, that is Peter Wheat, Pete Johnson, Real Agriculture's agronomist. Okay, uh, Jeff, do you, do you agree with uh, we or with Pete's premise there? Yeah, yeah. No, I think I think the split application is a is a very good strategy uh, from a, a risk standpoint, and uh, I think to get it on early is important. Uh, as you delay it, uh, you tend to get more of the nitrogen going to protein rather than recovery from yield. Uh, that, uh, that cereal crop or that oilseed crop like canola, it takes up a lot of the nitrogen that it needs for yield early on. And so that's important that you don't, you don't wait, you don't wait too late. I know with the, uh, with the dribble banding, uh, I'm a big fan of dribble banding. We did some work on forages a few years back on old grass stands and couldn't believe the response that we got to dribble banding some nitrogen. 30 to 50 pounds of nitrogen on an old brome grass stand nearly doubled the biomass yield and increased the protein of it to, to boot. And, uh, and it was just as good, the dribble banding on the surface, as the same rate coltered in. And it's a lot simpler to dribble band on the surface, but I do add the rider that we had some rain after application at all four of our sites that we uh, evaluated. So we did have some, some water there to move that nitrogen that was dribble banded on the surface into the soil. I guess the other thing I'd comment on, dribble band versus foliar spray. A few years back, we did some work with foliar spray. And you know one of the things you run into with the, with the foliar spray, the fan nozzle application is leaf burn. And, uh, and as a consequence of that, you know, I like the concept of having that dribble band uh, on the surface of the soil moving down through and, uh, and, and uh, ideally some rain to, to get it down through the thatch layer uh, down into where the roots are. Awesome stuff. Uh, great. Thanks a lot, Jeff. That was great. Uh, Greg? I know your 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 uh, wheat is not exactly your first love. You're you're more in the area of corn and beans, but talk. I, I spell it. I spell it correctly most days. 
<laughs> so, Greg, talk about the decision making and how is it different when you're talking about corn than how Pete just described it with wheat, or is the concept the same? I think some of the concepts are same. I'll save you the uh, chemistry lesson that Johnson tried to throw at us there, but uh, but 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 I I think the idea. Uh, when we talk about split applications, and 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 now I'm talking in corn, th the split application is really a decision between planting time and sort of mid-June side dress. And now with the advent of dribble bands, pushing that, what we're going to call the side dress window into surface bands that can be applied right into, well, pre-tassel corn, you know, mid-July mid corn. So those really are the three windows we're talking about. Uh, the advantage is there for for splitting in applications in corn, but it really should be said right up front that it's not huge. If you gather up all of the data from split application research across Ontario and throughout the Corn Belt, it's measured maybe in a in a five percent uh, efficiency boost for a split application. You know, it's it's not it's not much more than that. And so you can get you can get a little bit sidetracked in this split application discussion that, uh, wow, you know, you're going to increase yields by 20 bushels per acre. If you take your 175 pounds of N and split it planting time side dress or planting time side dress and then uh, and then dribble band. Uh, the advantages really are not that dramatic. And, you know, we like to use the term spoon feeding. I would love to say that spoon feeding your nitrogen to corn three or four times from planting to tassel adds 50 bushels. The reality is it rarely adds any yield at all to try. And, and if you take the costs of application into play, you're, yeah, there's just, there's just not as much there, I think, as what generally the industry promotes. I, I, I'm, I believe in the split application. You don't generally want to put it down all up front. You are smarter. You can make a better decision with a, with a split application that comes sometime uh, mid-June to early July. But more than two applications, I'm not interested. And I'd like to keep my head on my shoulders that a split application is not necessarily going to add that much yield to a corn crop. You, in a wet yeah. year, you might make a better decision. But but if all you're going to do is take the same rate, say it's 175 pounds of N, and you're going to always just take the 175 and split it, you won't get the advantages of being able to say, okay, I'm putting 100 pounds down up front, but then I'm going to make a decision on the 20th of June whether that corn crop warrants another 25 another 50 or another 75 then i think you start to make some gains that's over and above what you would get if you just take the same rate all the time and simply split it into two allocations well and i know one of the struggles because we get these questions every you know mid growing season where people are thinking about you know doing another application of n is okay how much Right, and we we've and, and corn has maybe forced us into this conversation. Some of the high yield guys out of the U.S. talking about you know weekly tissue tests, and you got to do this, and you got to send it to the lab. But then it's it's interpreting those results. What's actually the benchmark? It, it's a puzzle on the how much, Greg. I think that's a big confusing yeah. issue. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, well, we could we could we could delve into that quite deep, but I'm going to throw out just a, I'm going to throw out just a, a couple of reminders when we talk about thinking you're going to push your corn yields to sort of new levels, right? And that and that requires much more nitrogen. If you look at the government-based, right, uh, well-researched recommendations, and I know I can hear the eyes rolling in the crowds right now, but I'm gonna I'm gonna go there at any rate. Government-based, well-researched recommendations for 200 bushel corn. In Ontario, the average best recommendation on a loam soil after soybeans is 148 pounds of N to grow 200 bushel corn. In Ohio, it's 168, and in Michigan, it's 140. So 148, 140, and 168 pounds of nitrogen to essentially get your optimum return at around 200 bushel corn. So that's an important nail to drive in the wall right off the bat, 
that so you don't get too carried away with oh my gosh I can I can put nitrogen down right up to tassel time that must mean I should be able to put 250 pounds of nitrogen down et cetera et cetera the reality is that pretty good research shows that if you're growing 200 bushel corn on a loam soil you would rarely ever need 200 pounds of N to get there in fact the number's more like 150 yeah. 140 160 right so that to me is an important reminder before you get too caught up in spoon feeding or y dropping or side dressing you know know sort of what the average return on your nitrogen investment is and what the optimum N rate often is for growing 200 bushel corn in the in the east well, and how much rain are we going to get in July? I think that's part of the question. It's part of the considerations too, Jeff. Yeah, and and, and on the cereal side, about like new new high yielding hard red spring wheat varieties have incredible yield potential built in them. To get high yield and protein, you really got to crank on the nitrogen. As some work uh, that was done recently at in Manitoba. Yeah, uh, Jeff. There's a question here. I'm going to ask you. I'm just going to take the bottom piece off there. Uh, the question here from Danny Ottenbright, Farms in Grace in Saskatchewan. What about adding humic acid to nitrogen? Um, I don't think that the, the humic acid would have much influence on the nitrogen per se in terms of a reaction with the nitrogen. Humic materials, the main effect that they have on, on plants is through a, a kind of a hormonal or growth stimulation effect. Uh, it might stimulate some root growth that might in turn perhaps uh, enhance nitrogen uptake. But overall, a direct interaction between the humic acid and nitrogen, I'm not really aware of any type of a, of a particular reaction that might take place that, 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 that would actually influence, for example, the availability of that nitrogen in that fertilizer. Greg, any experience with humic acid? Uh, worked at it a little bit this year. I'm uh, I'm I'm pretty much a neophyte on it. I I uh, I guess my comment, and maybe I would like to hear Jeff's comment on it, is if I was going to apply humic acid to a to a field, I'm inclined to think that I would put it in a fertilizer band or with my UAN as opposed to just dribbling it on the soil or putting it in the furrow without a connection to the fertilizer. I see some support in the research for having humic acid connected with the fertilizer band. I'm intrigued by that. It's not what I did this year, but I'm intrigued by it. Jeff, comment on whether you think there's an advantage to actually putting humic acid with your end supply as opposed to uh, putting it down in furrow, in the seed, mm -hmm. or, 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 or think, just yeah. on the soil surface. And I haven't really done any work specifically with humic acid and nitrogen availability. But I, I guess I would say I would kind of like to have it where the roots are. Uh, and, you know, oftentimes that's that's going to be where the fertilizer band is, too. But uh, I think yeah, that root stimulation aspect might be the, the one that you're, you're kind of going for with uh, with any type of, a, of an organic acid that may be a, a kind of a... a, of a of a, a root growth stimulator. Hmm. Before we get to our next right. clip, I'm going to bring on a few more questions here. Question from uh, 69 Druth. What's, what's the best bang for the buck liquid or granular uh, Greg in your, in your crop types, obviously corn and beans. Uh, well, when we, if, if I deal with that question, uh, liquid or granular, uh, I'll make the comparison in Ontario that, or, or Quebec or the East that, you know, that's a urea comparison versus a UAN comparison. So liquid, uh, UAN 28% versus urea. Yeah. You know, it, the differences, uh, really, I think are, are almost non-existent providing the fertilizer gets into the soil and you don't have volatilization losses. Urea is going to be much more susceptible to volatilization losses than UAN is. But if you want to just talk about the product, and, and I'll use the example of UAN surface applied and incorporated with a cultivator, urea surface applied and incorporated with a cultivator. If that's the scenario and we're just looking at product to product comparisons, I don't think there's any difference at all. But when you start talking about the logistics of, okay, surface applications versus banded applications, then you start to see some differences. To me, most of the challenges that in, in the East, urea surface applied is a much bigger risk 
for volatilization losses than UAN. Jeff, how about you? Yeah, I would say the same thing. Uh, you know, volatilization losses, straight urea, higher potential versus the UAN, which has 50% of the nitrogen in, in, in uh, urea form and the rest of it as, as ammonium nitrate. Uh, you know, placed equivalent way, uh, manner in soil, probably not a lot of difference. I guess from an operational standpoint, I've seen some folks uh, use the liquid very efficiently in some old cedars using that squirt concept in a single shoot, uh, uh, old single shoot uh, cedar unit, using the squirt concept to simply squirt that liquid fertilizer to the side of the seed and get some separation, uh, which is a little bit more difficult to do with a with a granular form. So uh, operationally, uh, the liquids can, can, can uh, certainly provide some, some potential advantages sometimes. Cool, good stuff. Keep the questions coming, everybody. If you do have a question or a comment, uh, please just add it to the comment box, whether you're watching on YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, or Twitch. We're going to play our last clip. It is with uh, a private agronomist, independent agronomist here in, in Alberta. It is Matt Gosling. His company is Premium Ag. Uh, this video was, was taken a number of years ago. Uh, I remember it being filmed. Uh, Matt's going to talk about a number of nitrogen strategies and then we will get our panel to provide some con, uh, some comment, and we'll get to more of your questions. Here is Matt Gosling. Uh, part of our, our scouting program is trying to visit these fields once a week and noticing things. So we were just here uh, a couple days ago and noticed these uh, strips uh, in this field. And... Uh, um, Getting out and taking a, a tissue test at the two or three leaf stage, which is what this plant is, is really, really valuable because the cereal plant will typically respond to nitrogen up until about the five leaf stage. So by the time we take a test, see these symptoms, get it to the lab and get results back in recommendation, um, we're lucky, we're close to Calgary, so we get quick freight to the lab, but uh, it's typically four to four to seven days. So we still have about a week. In a week, this plant's going to put on a leaf, maybe two leaves if it's really warm and humid. So we re you really have to be on the early side of diagnosing a problem. If a field looked like this, and there are strips or there's definite signs uh, of nitrogen shortages or deficiencies in the plant, I would just apply. Um, because time is so critical, we've got a spotty forecast with, with showers and stuff so everything works better when it's wetter. Typically a wheat plant will put on about a leaf a week after it emerges. Um, so we've got about a month and by the time your crop comes up you finish seeding you're at two or three leaf and you're thinking of spraying uh, we've basically got about 10 to 14 days typically in a wheat situation to uh, do a top dressing. Um, so as predictable as the forecasts are, uh, pay attention to them and if you get some, some favorable weather conditions, apply when you have a, a wet forecast coming. Um, like I said, the, the wheat plant or a cereal plant will typically respond to nitrogen up to about five leaf. This is really, really sandy soil. So when we have really sandy soil like this, um, our nitrogen is prone to uh, mainly leaching, which is just nitrogen movement down through the profile, um, where roots might not be able to um, uptake that nitrogen through the year. Uh, the other main nitrogen loss mechanism that's happened uh, across the prairies is um, denitrification, where just uh, excess of moisture uh, basically saturates the soil. There's no oxygen in there. Um, the, the organic matter and, and all the bugs are, are really um, slow and inactive and uh, the nitrogen ends up turning into a gaseous form and um, going up into the atmosphere. Um, fertilizer in, uh, in crop or post seeding is always really risky um, just in the sense uh, especially in the uh, urea. Broadcasting urea on, on the surface after a crop has been seeded, um, you could lose a very significant amount of that nitrogen to volatilization. And that's dependent on pH and soil temperature, soil moisture, uh, a wind, uh, whatnot. Um, there are protection 
strategies you can have on that in treating um, urea with agritane. Um, that'll protect it for you know up to 10 to 14 days worth. Um, when you get the rain, it dissolves the nitrogen and, and uh, that's a really good strategy. Using ESN this time of year in broadcasting, um, as much as I love ESN in early seeding or winter wheat, I don't think that would at all be a, a really good fit for this situation. Dribble banding is awesome. Um, it's in a liquid form, it gets into the soil. Um, using a, a product like UAN, urea ammonium nitrate, uh, which is a 2800 product. So absolutely, I think it's a good idea. Um, use the diagnostic tools you have, look at your field. Clay soils, um, like we work with uh, some really heavy clay soils and it's unbelievable how well it holds nitrogen. This soil, uh, I looked it up on my soil test here in the field and it, it just does not hold it. This is um, 65 to 85% sand in, in this area. So we have to take t uh, texture tests when we're doing our, our manure applications. Um, so in that case, we're looking at a centimeter a day of nitrogen movement through the soil. Um, I've seen a lot of clay soils that were fertilized in the fall or in the spring and went months without being seeded in, into um, another crop for forage or whatever and the nitrogen was still there. It may move in the profile but the way we take our tests in, in segregating the different depths we'll do a 0 to 6, a 6 to 12 and a 12 to 24. The other nitrogen strategy that I really like to use, uh, and this is something that, that our, our provinces to the east of us have used for years, is applying nitrogen and top dressing as a risk management tool. I love that strategy. Um, so what we're doing is we're, we're fertilizing for an average crop. So say we're fertilizing for a 50 bushel crop. If we have the conditions today that look like, yeah, these uh, things are looking good, we're going to shoot for a 60 bushel crop, we can do it, but we've got 10 days to do it. So we can apply another 20 or 30 pounds of nitrogen on as a dribble band or get lucky and uh, if you have pivots you can broadcast on some urea and water it in. Um, there's lots of different ways to get nitrogen into your soil. Um, some have more risk than others. Okay, Jeff, let's start with you. What uh, We talked about some of those topics already. Uh, any commentary there on what you heard from Matt? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, the post-emergent urea, uh, making sure that you have that urease inhibitor there. If it's just going to sit there on the surface, uh, you need to have something there to block that hydrolysis to ammonia for a period of time to give a chance for a rain to come along and move it in. Again, uh, the, you know, the, the dribble banding of the UAN solution that we've talked about, I think, is a really good strategy for that, for that post-emergent uh, application. Uh, nitrogen losses, again, as a function of, of, of texture, uh, those heavier textured soils, uh, particularly in the spring of the year, uh, after snow, snow melt, that's a, a, a period of time where we do see a lot of denitrification losses that conversion of nitrate to nitrous oxide and, and N2 gas. And I, I think Greg also spoke about that as well uh, being an issue, uh, you know, one of the major loss mechanisms of nitrogen in on, Ontario as, as well. Uh, so the, uh, the, uh, the polymer coated uh, ureas uh, in a broadcast application scenario uh, could be effective, but uh, I know that, that, that some, some studies have been done and I, I go back here to forages uh, where they, they didn't perform uh, particularly well on forages uh, broadcast on the surface because uh, uh, if, you, if, if it's a slow release and you're still getting that nitrogen released onto the surface, uh, you're still going to be getting that, uh, that hydrolysis taking place on the surface and the, the loss of the nitrogen as the ammonia. Well, speaking of broadcasting, did, Greg, did you see the UK? DEFRA is talking about banning broadcasting of, of N. Did you see that story? I haven't seen that particular one, but uh, it certainly doesn't surprise us that we're going to be under more pressure uh, to, uh, to uh, well, I shouldn't say maybe eliminate, but there's going to be pressure on, on broadcast applications of nitrogen and phosphorus for sure. What I found most intriguing about the video uh, is the early deficiency, right? 
And, uh, you know, he mentioned, you know, well, we came to the field, we saw some, some, uh, some end deficiency early in the season. That has me particularly intrigued in terms of what we've been seeing in Ontario. As we have talked so much about wide dropping or side dressing or split applications, we have generally backed off of nitrogen up front, uh, either broadcast at planting time or certainly through the planter. I've seen some work and we had some plots of our own this year that I get I get disturbed or I start to wonder how much yield we're giving up if we're not keeping the nitrate concentration, the end supply right around that plant uh, quite high early in the season. So, you know, let's say a typical Ontario operation might be, uh, you know, you, 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 uh, you broadcast either spray or broadcast granular, maybe 30 to 50 pounds. And then in furrow with the, uh, with the planter would maybe be three pounds, right? So you've got 30 to 50 broadcast and you've got three pounds in furrow. I question, and then of course, everything else is going to come later, either side dress or, or dribble band later. I question whether we've got the end concentration high enough in the row zone uh, to, uh, to produce top end yields. And so if I'm looking for where I'm going in 2021 uh, in my corn operation, I'm considering what equipment changes I would have to make. And this goes for my own research program at Mazex. What equipment changes do I have to make to sort of supercharge the end concentration right in that row zone to make sure that I am not deficient in that first uh, six, sta six leaf stages of corn? Jeff, talk about end deficiencies. Matt, Matt referred to it. What, what am I looking for so I know that I have end deficiencies? Yeah, I'll, I'll maybe just back up a little bit. And, Go ahead. And along along the lines of what Greg was talking about, you know, that uh, that supply of nitrogen early on that, that can be accomplished by applying nitrogen at the time of seeding. And, you know, we've got excellent equipment now uh, here in Western Canada for in-soil placement of nitrogen at seeding in a side row, a mid-row band. Uh, the other is, is placement of nitrogen in the seed row. Depending on the opener configuration that you've got, the, the, the spread and the row spacing, what together we call it seed bed utilization, dictates how much nitrogen you can put in the, in the seed row. It's, it, it, that's, a good, that's a good placement for nitrogen, but again, we have to be aware that too much causes problems. So we do have those maximum safe rates of nitrogen you can put in the seed row. Uh, that the guidelines and that's probably one of the of the the most commonly asked questions is how much nitrogen can I put safely safely down in in, in the seed row? Um, I guess when it comes to you know the nitrogen deficiency detection standpoint, you know you're looking for those symptoms out there. You're looking for that yellowing, that chlorosis of the of the old leaves. Uh, in canola, sometimes we see a, a purpling. The nitrogen's mobile mobile in the plant. Um, you know, your soil test, again, that you take as close as, as close as possible to the time of seeding is a really good indicator. And lots of folks use tissue testing as well as an indication of, of, of a limitation that, that seems to be showing up uh, in the middle of the season. And of course, it's always good to think about nutrient balance too. You can't just think about nitrogen in isolation. You got to be thinking about the phosphorus, the potassium, the sulfur as, as well. So it's all part of a package, Sean. And it's, 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 it's an important package. Like I said, it is not a cheap input, <laughs> but it's an important input. we got to make the right decisions. Uh, let's get to some more questions here, guys. Uh, question from Danny. What's the best depth to place nitrogen at seeding time in Western Canada? So you just talked about, you know, like location to seed and things like that, Jeff. But what about yeah. the depth? Yeah, I, I, I like to think of if it's urea, you know, I, I like to have it at least an inch below the surface. Uh, shallow banding uh, can cause some increased losses of nitrogen through volatilization. Uh, if that volatil if that hydrolysis of the urea takes place, you know, close to the really close to the surface. So, you know, get it down in. I, I, again, I like to see it to, in a band covered up, but you know, at least an inch uh, below the surface. Uh, great stuff. Uh, Johnson, of course, even when he's not a guest here, he's always correcting me. He just said, uh, UK not talking about banning all in, just urea. Denitrification loss into the air affecting the environment. Thanks, Pete. I appreciate that. Uh, Pete does have a question here, though. 
Uh, I'll talk about urease inhibitor with urea. What about 28% dribble band into a good canopy? Uh, Greg, we'll start with you. It's more of a wheat question, though. No, it's a good because uh, we do lots of dribble banding into uh, corn canopies. And, uh, and of course, surface applied, you would consider that that would be a situation where a urease inhibitor would give you some uh, improvement or some reduction in losses. Uh, but I think when, when, uh, when Pete refers to a good canopy, uh, you know, a good canopy in a corn crop on the 1st of July means, means probably that the wind speed in that canopy is near zero. And therefore, how much, uh, how much, uh, volatilization do you actually get if uh, if the wind speed is cut right down because of the canopy in some of the models, if you insert a wind speed of zero, your your volatilization loss is near zero. So, as as much as I am intrigued by perhaps the advantage of a urease inhibitor, uh, I, I think as the canopy gets big and as the wind speed gets uh, reduced, the potential losses are pretty small. And I'll only add one thing, and and that in our experience and our research plots. When we lay the urea on wet soil and it's followed by 10 days of dry weather, that's the, that's the worst case scenario. When you lay the urea down on damp soil and then you don't get a rain, maybe a play for a urease inhibitor there, but, uh, mm. but uh, it, it's, it's, it's a hard one. And, and the better scenario is you lay your urea down on dry soil and then you do get a rain. Uh, that's a much safer scenario. Jeff? Yeah, that, that wet soil followed by dry out. Yeah, you get that that competition for absorption sites. And uh, as a result, you really get get not very good conversion of the ammonia into the ammonium ion and, and retention. So yeah, I've seen that. I've seen that as well. And, and interesting, I've seen the scenario is this year, really, really dry conditions in southern Saskatchewan. It never rained for a month uh, at all. And so your urease inhibitor you know, not maybe last couple of weeks. Under those kinds of situations, you might want to be using a urease inhibitor. And I knew that I know there's some new products out there that last a little bit longer than two weeks to to allow for that window. Sometimes it can take a long time uh, in the uh, brown soil zone of the prairies to actually get a rain to uh, to move that uh, urea into the soil. And uh, you know, maybe by that time, a lot of that inhibitor has has worn off. Uh, good question here. I'd be remiss if I didn't ask about other soil microbes filling the niche in the end cycle in regards to nitrification inhibitors. Jeff, you want to tackle that one? Yeah. So, and I guess what I, I kind of like to see that leading up to is, uh, nice. Up. nice. Nice. Here. Yeah. And uh, I just happen to have, and I've been growing in my house here for my students here. Uh, peas growing in a nitrogen deficient soil, very nitrogen deficient soil. Uh, the one here, yeah, that's better. <laughs> sliding around. <laughs> there we are. The one here in my left hand has no nitrogen added, and here in my right hand, as I point my finger up, has nitrogen added. And you'll note there's really no difference no. in the growth of those peas without nitrogen and with nitrogen added. Why is there no difference? What's going on in the pot, in the peas that have no nitrogen added, that still looks as good as with the nitrogen? Nitrogen fixation. And if I pull those pea plants out and that uh, treatment that has the nitrogen fertilizer added, I will see very few or no nodules. And on the treatment that... Uh, doesn't have any nitrogen fertilizer, and I did add a rhizobial inoculant, I'll see lots of nitro nodules on there, uh, nice red ones that are carrying out nitrogen fixation. So uh, that uh, contribution that legumes make to, nitrogen to, to the soil nitrogen pool, to the soil nitrogen cycle, uh, through fixation is very important. And if we add too much nitrogen fertilizer, that benefit is greatly diminished. So for some legumes, a little bit of starter nitrogen can be beneficial, but not too much. Uh, for example, soybeans, uh, some dry beans that uh, don't have good inoculants, we've found a little bit of starter nitrogen there can be a benefit, not too much. 
for some of the other pulses, uh, if you've got a good inoculant, good conditions to get that, that uh, nitrogen fixation established, it may be a little bit slower to grow. You may see a little bit reduced height early on, but at this stage here, with and without nitrogen, not much difference, and oftentimes that shows up as, as well as, as little difference in the yield. See, Greg, you see the, the pulse. The pulse guys have it so easy. They just fix their own nitrogen. It's like super, super simple, right? The the dream of nitrogen fixing corn, right? I got five more years till I retire, so you got to hold off on the end fixing corn. We got, I, I got, I got to continue to milk the nitrogen management as long as I can. <laughs> okay, but what about soybean management? And Jeff kind of hit it on a little bit there, but you know, I, I was talking to Horst Bonner, soybean specialist Lomafra. He was talking about you know sometimes uh, we we need to really think about that nitrogen strategy with soybeans to to really push higher, even though we're you know we're we're breaking records in soybean yields, there's still potential for more. Yeah, it's been something we've tried a lot over the years. I still am a naysayer. Uh, I, I mean, yeah, maybe maybe in early planting and cold soils that there's there's an advantage to some end fertilizer going down with the soybeans. But uh, uh, I have a hard time getting my head around the idea that uh, we're going to grow an end fixing crop like soybeans that'll do 60 bushel per acre, and we think we're going to muss much with that because we're adding 10 pounds or 20 pounds of nitrogen up front. I'm uh, I'm prepared to skip the nitrogen on soybeans for the most part. Okay, here is a question from Green Thumb Grower One, uh, Greg: How much yield loss can side dress burn cause? And thoughts on how to time application to avoid it? Yeah, great question. Uh, if you if you're thinking about a corn plant that's got six leaves on it, and you were to hit it with UAN uh, on the surface uh, and caused uh, I don't know let's say 30% uh, of the leaves get some burn, uh, it's really difficult to measure much significant yield loss when you burn leaves up to about six leaf corn. When you get beyond six leaf corn and you start Con well, you continue to throw UAN down in a pattern w that would uh, well, even if it's a, even if it's a pattern that doesn't burn the leaves completely, you start to get some yield loss that adds up. But you you can really go up to about six leaf corn before you can cause much burn that would result in any sort of real yield loss. Beyond six leaf corn, yeah, you've got to stop doing the foliar hit and getting it down on the soil. I'm going to generalize this question. Uh and talk about just general mistakes. A uh, question from Kara. When it comes to nitrogen on crops, what is the number one mistake made by growers? Jeff, what, what's one of those common things that you see where we're, we're still maybe falling into a bit of a, what I would call like an old wives tale or sort of that's how we've always done it. And we're, we're you're out there trying to correct it all the time. Yeah, I guess in, in, in small grains and, you know, thinking again about, uh, uh, cereals and, and oil seeds. Um, I think sometimes people still tend to want to push it a little bit much in terms of how much nitrogen they're putting on in the seed row along with other nutrients like phosphorus and potassium and sulfur. And we have to be, be careful about that. And, and really, I like to encourage growers to uh, instead of trying to load on the nitrogen in the seed row, uh, separate it, put it in a separate band because nitrogen is mobile in the soil. Phosphorus is relatively immobile. It's important to have the phosphorus where the roots are going to be able to get it early on. The nitrogen, you can have it further, further, further away. So, uh, you know, I, I, I think to, 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 to not try to, to push too much, much uh, nitrogen in that seed row is, uh, is, is, and pay attention to those maximum safe uh, uh, guidelines, I think is important in getting a, a good stand established. Uh, you know, some of the crops uh, uh, like canola can be a very good compensator for a reduced plant population in some instances, but maybe in some others where you reduce that population, you may end up increasing the degree of weed infestation and experience some, some yield loss. So uh, mm. that's, I guess, I guess, I guess that's one thing. And also, Greg, 
also raised the point about uh, you know using the uh, the polymer coated urea, the ESN, uh, to be able to apply a higher rate safely in the seed row, and that's certainly something that we've seen and and, and experienced in our trials. That's uh, you know an, another way to to get around that if, if seed row placement is your only option. I mentioned about squirting liquid off to the side. Another is to use that uh, polymer coated urea to uh, increase the rate that you can safely place place with the uh, with the seed. Great stuff. Greg, any uh, things that you see out there that, you know, in terms of mistakes? Oh, wow. Yeah. You know, in my government days, I would immediately go to over application. You know, you do not need 220 pounds of nitrogen to get 220 bushels of corn. Uh, now I'm in the private sector and if I'm selling my hybrid out to a field, it's really, it's really, it's really difficult to say, well, you better not use so much nitrogen. But I think in generally, in general terms, uh, you know, keeping yourself centered, uh, looking at, looking at uh, yield expectation and soil type and, and, and sort of integrating a few of those components together to keep your nitrogen rate in the right realm. You, you don't have to be right on. Nitrogen is not a, is not a bullseye game. Uh, you can miss by 20 pounds either side of your optimum end rate, and it costs you very little in terms of net economic hit. Um, but but yeah, I still think it's the one of the number one questions in Eastern uh, corn uh, agronomy is how many pounds of N do I really need to grow 225 bushels of corn? And if your answer is immediately 225, that's probably going to be one of your bigger mistakes, right? <laughs> Hey, uh, and another one from Johnson here for you, Greg. If you get yield loss after six leaf corn, what about urea as shoulder high corn burn? Yes. Johnson asked that question because he knows I don't know the answer. Uh, but uh, <laughs> but we have, uh, we, ha we have that problem of, uh, you know, uh, shoulder high, over the top urea. And it's really not a burn. The urea gets into the whirl. It, it gets into the plant and it's almost a toxic effect. Uh, I don't know what the answer is to that. I think it's, uh, I think it's marginal uh, as long as it grows out of it, uh, you know, at least by, say, 10 days before, before tassel. If, if all of the symptoms have disappeared by, by the time you're 10 days before tassel emergence, I think the impacts are pretty minimal. If the burn from over the top urea lasts into that window that's closer to tassel than 10 days, then yeah, I think there's a hmm. I think there's a there's a yield hit there that could be in the neighborhood of 10 bushel. Guys, we blew through an hour. Uh, that went extremely fast. This has been so much fun. I really appreciate all the questions from the audience. Great stuff. Uh, Greg Stewart of Mazex. Thanks a lot, Greg. I really appreciate it. Hey, it was fun to be with you. Thanks very much. Thanks, Jeff. Nice to meet you. Great. Had lots of fun. Great interaction, Greg and, and Sean. Enjoyed it very much. Yeah, Jeff. Th thanks a lot. I really appreciate you, uh, you joining us here as well. And like I said, thanks to all the audience for being here. This is episode two of The Agronomist. We're going to continue to do this throughout the winter. Monday nights in prime time, 8 o'clock Eastern, 7 o'clock Central, 6 o'clock Mountain. And I want to thank everybody for joining us here tonight. Thank you very much for getting real and getting connected with real agriculture. And we'll chat again tomorrow. Cheers, everybody.